Yo, why is this guy such a big deal? Just break it down. I mean, <laughs> it's t- it's a hard, it's a hot question you just came out with, but I can actually answer that. Shangri Meng, who joined us from Databricks, where he has was the first machine learning engineer, has been for about eight years, uh, is actually years. one of the lead maintainers for both MLflow and MLlib, and by the way, is also an Apache PMC member for Spark. Yeah, he's a big deal. This guy has built a lot of what you guys are out there are all using. And he yeah. came on to tell us what he does and how he thinks about it all. Dude, my favorite part was at the end when he just walked us through basically how he looked at the problem and how to tackle the problem. It was like seeing the internal workings of someone's mind. Like he was so clear was, at, okay, yeah. well, I thought about this and then we thought about this and then I tried to go and find where it was already being done. But then I realized, well, you know, with TFX, it's not really working because they're built for Google scale. And so then I went to other things and at the end of the day, we did it this way and that's why we were opinionated. I almost wanted to keep riffing on that. Too bad that time was kind of up. Uh, and what about you? What were some highlights, takeaways on your end? I actually really liked hearing about his experience getting started at Databricks and sticking around. Like, it's so cool when somebody um, has been actually at the same place working on machine learning at the same time that so much in machine learning has changed. And I thought that that was a pretty remarkable uh, just part of the podcast to just listen to, reflect on. uh, And I'm really grateful that he was able to come on and share all that with us. So true. So true. So let's get into it. This was an awesome episode with Shang Rui, and he has affected, he has touched so many lives inadvertently through Spark, through ML Flow, through ML Lib. I mean, it's awesome to get to talk to this guy. Let's jump right into it. Why don't you give us a little bit of a download on who you are and what you do? Yep. Uh, hi, uh, this is Xiang Rui from Databricks. So I'm currently a uh, Uber tech lead on the machine learning engineering team and just working with individual engineering teams on various of our ML product features. Uh, I joined Databricks about eight and a half years ago. So I was the first machine learning engineer here and initially just uh, working on the machine learning library in Spark called MLlib and basically just uh, design the APIs and uh, implement the major algorithms and working with the community to skill the project development also has uh, spent a few years on uh, our internal data team just as uh, being a data engineer and data scientist and using our own product to handle our uh, log logs and etl data data warehouse and data analytics um yeah that's me i feel like there's so much that i could just ask you and in, in that short bio that you just <laughs> shared the fact that you joined databricks eight and a half years ago the fact that you were the first ML engineer there, you worked on ML Lib early on, like each of those things we could go into. Demetrios, I'm gonna take some creative liberty here. I'm gonna, well, yeah, you got something to say <laughs> yes. first, Demetrios? <laughs> yes, no, no, where are you gonna go with this? Cause I wanna know what kept you at Databricks for eight years and what has enticed yeah. you enough, but Vishnu, like where, mm-hmm. where'd you wanna go with this? Let's roll with it, let's roll with it. What's what's kept you here uh, at Databricks for eight and a half years now, Shangri? So uh, maybe to answer that, it's, uh, I, I may talk about the work I did before Databricks. I uh, was at LinkedIn for one year. It's, I started there as a machine learning research engineer and building some machine learning platforms on top of MapReduce. Uh, but I, when I started, it's uh, very clear to me, MapReduce wasn't really designed for machine learning. Right, so big people do it machine learning on MapReduce because MapReduce is the production cluster compute. And, but in order to do machine learning, it's a little bit awkward. It's uh, because MapReduce by default is just a read a batch and a save a batch. And machine learning, you need many iterations. And people just end up with holding the mappers and uh, just let them do more iterations, uh, throw away the MapReduce uh, uh, paradigm, right? So, but at the end, you just feel you're doing something on the wrong platform. You're doing the correct thing. People need a machine learning platform. That's very clear. But you are doing it on the on the on the wrong base, right? So, but over time, I feel wow, this is not really the direction to go. And then I saw the spark. It's uh, there. There is an intern uh, in a sister team, and 
try to setting up Spark. I took a read on the Spark paper. I feel, oh, this is nice. This is the data caching and you can handle many iterations and uh, that's good for machine learning. So that's how, why I happen to know the, the co-founders, but I didn't know their work. It's a, just a small word. I just called them and say, oh, you started this new company called Databricks, uh, but it seems uh, you guys are all system people. You need some people who can handle this uh, analytics, right? So machine learning. So maybe I can, I can, I can do that. So that's how I get into Databricks. So, uh, but during the interview, it's the, the co-founders and uh, show me the product, the early version of the product. So that surprised me a lot because I, I got in touch with Databricks uh, because of Spark. Uh, but at that time is, I think the co-founders already had a clear prediction of the future. And uh, the future is cloud computing, right? So they know that um, within a couple of years and everyone, every company will be in the cloud. And then they start designing the product for that future rather than design the product for the, for the, for the year 2013, right? So, and that surprised me and their, their product vision is really this a unified analytics platform. And if you saw the early demo version of the product, it doesn't look very different from the product now. We just add a lot of features, but essentially the the direction never never changed, right? So that's really why all I want to just uh, stay with Databricks and keep improving this uh, uh, product towards the original product vision. Is I think the the co-founders and had very accurate prediction of the future, and they also have a really strong execution. It's uh, just uh, say align the teams and execute towards the same direction. And, and also definitely, I also believe that it's having this unified engine uh, platform can make just the uh, people like data analysts, data scientists, and the data engineers who usually don't speak the same language and uh, live under the same roof and uh, try to use the same tool to collaborate. That's amazing, but we're not there yet. So that's why, well, I think there's still lots of things to do. And uh, that's, that's kind of why I stay here for more than eight years. Wait, and why do you think you're not there yet? What still needs to be done? There's so many things. That's why we have this ML Ops podcast, right? So it's uh, that's why ML Ops is still a mess. <laughs> so it is, uh, it's not simple. Yeah. For example, it's, uh, I remember there in the MapReduce uh, stage, there there is the statistics professor from Stanford, and talk about oh it's uh, why data scientists need to know MapReduce, right? So it's uh, why MapReduce is so popular, and he look at the map, the the white elephant book, and then figure out okay so because instead of saying you just compute mean and variance, now you need to understand how you compile it down to MapReduce what's inside the mapper, what's inside the reducer. And that's very hard. That's so hard, right? So, and he doesn't believe that data scientists need to know MapReduce, right? So the data scientists only need to know, uh, they want to compute mean and virus. The engine should be able to take care of that. So uh, to make it super simple, and so data scientists don't need to get to the low level details. And that's how we came up with Spark. With Spark, you don't need to understand MapReduce anymore. Right, so you just uh, use Spark to do the things you need. And I think same applies to general data science and machine learning. It's still so hard. People still need to learn many things they are not familiar with and that they sh eventually it shouldn't be their skill set. So yeah, that's why I think it's uh, there's still so many things to do because the product is not that simple to use. Let's let that sit for a second. <laughs> No, I think I, I, I totally see what you're saying there uh, around the fact that there's still so much that can be done to empower people to do their best work. Uh, I think a lot of people on our podcast and the community in general are like, I wish I had to, I spent less time figuring out the tools of the trade and more time using them to drive value in whatever that might be, right? In terms of ap actually applying the tools. and. I'm kind of wondering, you know, you have had this incredible experience of being at Databricks for, you know, quite some time, being able to be the first machine learning engineer. 
What is it that made you passionate about the fact that people should be able to apply machine learning? Uh, what is it, what got you into machine learning in the first place? Uh, yeah, so my major at school wasn't machine learning. My major at school was uh, computational math. What I do is really just uh, numerical optimizations and the simulation linear algebra. And but this is actually I'm very familiar with implementing those machine learning algorithms because well the building blocks for those solvers are really linear algebra, right? So you do matrix vector multiplication, how to do this uh, scale in a scalable and performant way. So that was my major. That's why I started as a machine learning engineer and but on the back end implementing those algorithms. But over time, I see that, okay, so in order to utilize the, your data, really many, many companies, and they collect so many data, petabytes, uh, terabytes, right? So, but when you talk to them, it's, uh, they will tell you, oh, eventually they want, to, they want to get value from it. They're not just paying the storage cost. And what's the best way to get value? Well, they can have some data scientists to do this, uh, say, uh, EDA to do some dashboards and to tell them what happened in the past, right? So, but they care more about what will happen in the future, right? So they want to get into this uh, predictive business and uh, which requires machine learning. And uh, they can start with rule-based, but at the end to scale, they need uh, machine learning models and to power their business. So that's why I feel, well, it will be a huge impact, right? So to work on machine learning, to make machine learning easy to, to end users. So many companies they are with data sitting in their in their storage accounts, right? So they can really just make value out of it. One of the questions that popped up to me immediately there is, from the time that you started, both at Databricks and in machine learning to today, there have been so many changes in the way, ways that people <laughs> think about ML, the models that they're able to build, the tools that they use, right? Like it's I mean in ten years it's hard to imagine like how far we've come. And how much further we have to go, right? With things like large language models, uh, you know, models like Dolly and stuff like that. There's, <laughs> there's, there's. It's like we've come so far, and there's still so far to go. And I'm kind of curious, from your standpoint, as a, not just like a tool builder for the machine learning engineer, but as somebody that works on like very fundamental, um, I guess you could say like almost conceptual, like infrastructure that supports the entire machine learning ecosystem. How do you think about changes, the, the changes that have happened and, and, and you know, in, in terms of keeping what you build fresh for the future? Uh, I hope that kind of made mm -hmm. sense. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this yeah, out with you right yeah. now. Yeah, I think at the very beginning, it's uh, when I work on MLLib, I think it's mostly on uh, how to make your algorithm scalable so people can train over large data sets. And, but over time, is I see this trend shifted up from um, how to how to use those uh, pre-trained models, those model modules created by others, and to to train your own model, right? So to get a good accurate, just as a predictive model for your own business problems. And then another trend I see is uh, people care more about production. So back in the days, and a lot of people just doing the batch scoring. Right, so after they train a model, they do batch scoring, they upload the scores and the, to a database and to serve. But over time, people see that, oh, that doesn't address the business need. They start doing a lot of real-time uh, inference. And, but how to get models into production, right? So how to coordinate the work among these uh, multiple teams and becomes a, really a, a big challenge. So that's why while you see a lot of focuses on ML ops, rather than the core algorithm at this time. And there are more and more just uh, AI endpoints, right? So you can use and rather than think about what's behind the endpoint to get your jobs done. It's a, it's a great point about how the challenge has gone from, you know, at first it was just about scale and being able to do more and the way that people want to use it now has, has continuously changed. Uh, I know Demetrios has a question that he wants to ask you, so I'm going to kick it to him. I was just thinking about like when you talk about that evolution and I hear it being mentioned quite a bit and the like the problems or the snags that you can get into when you're going to real time and real time is very difficult. And I was wondering what you see as some core challenges 
when you're trying to make that transition to batch in real time? And what are use cases that lend themselves to real time? Because I imagine there's certain use cases, like uh, I believe Vishnu, we had on here fairly recently a guest who was saying, yeah, like real time isn't really a thing because they're in the healthcare sector. They don't need mm -hmm. to necessarily sure. have all that data right away and continuously be streaming and making predictions. Right. But then there are other use cases like a recommender system that it's much more interesting if it's real time, right? Yep. So two questions, really. What are some challenges that you've seen with getting to real time? And then what are some use cases that lend themselves to real time? Yep. So the first one is all depends on requirements, right? So it's not necessarily you put every model into real-time serving. And, but as mentioned that there's more and more real-time, it's not because, uh, well, this, there are more use cases demanding real-time. It was because back in the days, there wasn't good infrastructure to support real-time. And people have to do batch and do this uh, periodically upload of the predictions. Um, yeah, so, but now if you think about the challenges of real-time, it's really about how to automate the entire life cycle of your models in production. And especially around uh, the data side of things. For example, is how you make sure your model is doing a good job, right? So, and the, because if you put your model in real time, that means you really care about the time sensitivity of your data, right? So you want your model to give most just predictions based on most recent data. And that also means your data, you think your data change over time. That means you have to monitor your model closely and to see if your model has degraded performance. And, but it's really it's not just the model itself, right? So you can see, oh, there is a feature drift, uh -huh. but maybe your model performance is fine. But maybe your model quality, just model quality stay the same, but downstream business becomes bad, right? So you want to monitor all of them together. And then, well, if there is a, just uh, say a drift, significant drift, you have to trigger some model retraining, or you do this online updates of your model. That makes it hard because uh, if you go real time, that means your data change uh, frequently. And if your data change frequently, that means your model also needs to change frequently. One of the things I kind of want to ask here is I was taking a look at your LinkedIn profile because I was aggressively stalking you in preparation for this, uh, <laughs> for this podcast. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that you wrote and is about, it's a nice little equation for MLOps. And I'm going to read it here. And it's basically oh. DevOps plus data ops plus model ops equals MLOps. And I was like, okay, that's an interesting summary right there. And I'm curious, like, what led you to that formulation? And, and why is that? accurate yeah this is uh, because we saw usually MLOps is a multi-team spot this is observation from our customers and they have this uh, data science teams who creates the output uh, models or training code right so there is this uh, production engineering team and who are not necessarily machine learning engineers because uh, not every company has a machine learning engineer team so they are traditional kind of a DevOps team and apply this the standard software engineering practices. And there's always this data engineering team and supplying those uh, training data and the features and the, to the data scientists, right? So usually, well, those three teams need to collaborate a while to get some models shipped to production. And that's why I usually call this uh, data ops, model ops, and the dev ops, and putting them together and uh, it's MLOps, but yeah, just an arbitrary definition and it just uh, want to call it, it's a multi-team multi spot and you you have to have different personas collaborating to make your MLOps successful. I feel like I could ask you about your Databricks experience and the past and your opinions uh, until the end of time, but I really would love to talk a little bit more about some of the projects that you're working on. Uh, I know that you've worked on MLlib and that you're also currently involved very much in MLflow. And let's start with MLflow because we've actually had a couple different episodes mm -hmm. about that recently. And I know Demetrius has a couple questions he wanna he wants to ask there too. Can you tell us about your work uh, and what you do uh, to support MLflow right now? Yep. Yeah. So, um, 
I start looking at MOF flow and see well, what will be the next major feature to it. Um, and then, well, it's funny, I always tell people is there are so many flow products. I also hear that from your previous podcast. It's, uh, there's TensorFlow, there's uh, MetaFlow, uh, what else, KubeFlow, right? So ML flow. Uh, but if you look at other Airflow, yeah, if you look at other flow products, they have flow components in it, right? So, but if you look at ML flow, it's uh, tracking and it's, uh, it's really good, right? So model flavors and the model registry, but it's kind of lacking the flow part. Right, so, and yeah, this is why while well, we uh, introduced this MLflow pipelines uh, to MLflow, it's actually just as uh, add this flow part. But uh, this is just, uh, uh, just joking. It's not really because MLflow is lacking the flow part and that's why. So it's really, we am working on this MLflow pipelines and based on some pinpoints we heard from Databricks customers and especially around productionizing a uh, machine learning model and what we call the production handoff. Uh, it's essentially, I mentioned, it's really a collaboration between the data science team and the production engineering team. And once the data scientist uh, figure out, oh, this is a good way to train a model, right? So let's ship it to production. And then the production team look at the artifacts, right? So the models, the code, and say, hey, well, this is not really the production quality code. And you cannot really ship a notebook to production. And that's also a good debate about whether notebooks can be in production or not. Oh yeah, as you can imagine, we've heard quite a few conversations about that mm -hmm. in Slack. It is one of those debatable things. What I'm wondering though, is what have you seen that actually works? Yes, it's uh, then while well, I look at this problem and see how we can solve the problem. This, uh, there are two kind of uh, solutions uh, we heard from customers and uh, it's not really a solution, it's just uh, what they do in practice. The first version is they will have their production engineering team fully take over the project. Uh, the first time they strip to production, that means they took over the notebook, they look at the code and they do the refactoring and they make it modularized and from now on, they own it. Right, so data, science, data scientists are really responsible for the experimentation part. Once it's done, once they got the initial good model, they, they hand it off. And the problem is um, you will run into uh, this machine learning engineering team. The, usually it's the machine learning engineering team. It's not the traditional production, the software engineering team. So we'll become the bottleneck because they start owning more and more kind of a machine learning project in production. They have a limited capacity and usually um, within uh, our customers, I see there are usually more data scientists, they're machine learning engineers, right? So that means they cannot scale yeah. and, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this version. And then another version I, I saw is the data scientist kind of, okay, take the advice from the production engineering team and the, do the code refactoring of their notebooks and make them regular, uh, modularized and using some IDEs they are not familiar with. And then finally they can ship it to production and they're happy, but production models never just uh, stay there forever, right? So they get degraded performance over time. And once there is some issues, the production engineers come back to data scientists, hey, your model has a problem and try to, try to improve it. And now, well, the data center look at, yeah, should I go with the IDEs I'm not familiar with, or should I go back to the notebook uh, where I produce the original model? And they usually they choose the notebook because that's the tool they are familiar with. And then they do some iteration, find out, oh, what went wrong? For example, some feature need update. And then they have to refactor this notebook again into modularized code and they ship it to production again. So I heard the complaints in this version is really uh, the productivity on the data science side is really bad. And the people complain about even just modify a single line of code and have to spend a day or two days on it, right? So to get into the production. So that's the initial, the biggest pinpoint we heard from customers and MLflow pipelines is an opinionated approach to solve that problem. And the, the solution here is really, we try to design a workflow and uh, let the data scientists to develop models 
and the in this opinionated uh, workflow such that whenever they find out a good model and we promise while well, this project is ready to ship to production they don't need the refactoring and on the on the production engineer side they can just uh, say ignore the exploration notebooks and from data scientists they only look at the modularized code and so i try to see design this uh, opinionated workflow to combine the best of notebooks and ides and the uh, info to to simplify this collaboration and the standardize uh, on this uh, production handoff so that's the uh the the first pinpoint ML flow pipelines try to solve is really we call production handoff. That is something that, of course, we hear all the time in the community. It is something that is a, a story that has been played over and over and probably a, a nightmare for some. And I feel like there are a few companies that are trying to attack it that way. Uh, they're really recognizing that Data scientists like that exploratory phase and they like to use their Jupyter notebooks. But when you have the handoff, you cannot bring that Jupyter notebook into production because it's mm -hmm. just not, it's not nice. And I remember when uh, about a month ago or a month and a half ago, I was in Toronto for the MLOps World Conference and I was talking to a data scientist and he was saying, oh, my ideal scenario is just to be able to have my notebook and throw it over the fence and then I don't want to know anything about it. I don't want to know. I just want to know if my model is producing what it said, it, like the accuracy of the model and that's it. And I was like, but what, like, what are you going to do? Like, how are the machine learning engineers or the people who are productionizing it, how are they supposed to understand this model? He was, and he was like, well, they have the Jupyter Notebook, <laughs> so it should be fine. <laughs> That's where I... Yeah, you need a standardization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you, you got to have that. So it's really, it's cool that you all are doing it this way. And I like to see that. And I like to see the trend and the more companies are trying to tackle this problem, right? And more teams mm -hmm. see the need for it because of this like it's almost this inflexibility where data scientists don't want to not use Jupyter notebooks but machine learning engineers don't want to use Jupyter notebooks and so you have to have a little bit of both i want to get into this next section which i know <laughs> you've probably got a ton to talk about while building ml flow while building just while working at databricks and going from spark like zero zero to spark you know what it is now do you have war stories or as we're trying to rebrand them ml oops stories what can you tell us about what are some huge ones that you have <laughs> mm, yeah let me let me think yeah i think it's uh um we built uh, many good features, right? So it's, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, it's uh, there are teams uh, building training features and building tracking features and the building this uh, hosted, uh, hosted uh, products. But uh, I did some experiments. It's uh, basically, I say, uh, I just tried to be a user and now I want to get a model into production. And then let's see how hard it is, right? So, and I try to wear this uh, ML engineer hat, right? So I try to think about uh, how I, I want to put the production security and as my top priority, rather than just uh, say data, san data scientist, uh, just a uh, productivity. Um, so then I try to see, oh, well, where is the, the isolation story, right? So how I can make my production environment secure. And that means I have to lock the data scientist out Right, so don't give them uh, right access. But after I lock them out, is uh, how can they get models into, into this uh, production, right? So do they just uh, throw the model artifact over the fence? And at that time is I only have the model artifact. I cannot really, I don't know how to automatically update this model, right? So whenever this model has an issue, I have to always go back to the data scientist and say, hey, could you throw a second version over, right? So 
And then while well, I start realizing, even we build those individual components, which is great, but things don't connect together, right? So it's uh, there are so many gaps in the in between, and uh, we have to also just as I say build features and to simplify uh, those uh, those connections as well, right? So at that time, I do feel oh, it's uh, before I did this experiment, I feel well, our product features are good. Right, so uh, they're still improving, but after I did this experiment, it's, oh, there's so many things to do, and uh, we should start it now. So uh, we did the internal kind of uh, uh, pivot of team and uh, to just uh, focus on MOPS. So after this experiment. Yeah, it's always, it's always has to do something with access of some mm -hmm. sort or some kind of, you know, compliance thing where you kind of yep. learn mm -hmm. a little bit about you know oh is uh, the system structure uh, set up right or, or are we are we thinking about building this the right way um i actually have a question with respect to how you design ml flow in an opinionated or ml flow pipelines in an opinionated mm -hmm. way as you said right yep. and i think what i want to hone into here is like when we say opinionated it, it usually means that there's a disagreement Right. There's one peop some side that wants to do one thing one way and sometimes someone that wants to do something yes. another way. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm kind of curious, like apart from the Jupyter Notebooks question, can you give us another example where you guys had to decide, look, there's one way that we believe ML engineering should be done in this context with respect to productionizing. Mm -hmm. And there's yep. a totally different way to do it. But we decided to go one way. Yeah. So, um, well, when I see this problem is uh, I start looking for existing solutions because I don't believe that I'm the first one to solve this problem, right? So, and then I start looking at TFX, Metaflow, and uh, those products exist um, many years ago, right? So especially TFX is from Google, is uh, kind of bulletproof, right? So for large scale uh, production use cases. And then I went to their tutorial, it's, uh, but I look at this, uh, well, if I'm wearing the data scientist hat, is this is not really something I want to use. And uh, because I have to construct the DAG myself, right? So a lot of boilerplate code, if you look at their, their tutorial, and uh, then I try to, try to understand why. So why, well, just the data scientists have to do this, or why this product was designed this way? And my answer is, this is my guess, is TFX was designed inside Google and to solve Google scale of problems. Right, so their target users are Google's ML engineers, or we call full stack data scientists, uh, who can do things end to end, who follow those uh, software engineering practices. And then, well, TFX makes sense, right? So it's a flexible tool you can compose and uh, differently, and it can scale. But for the data scientists we see among our customers, and I don't feel that's the product design for them. And similarly, Metaflow. It's very similar. It's Metaflow. You can easily construct the the steps and then construct the DAG, and but at the end, it's uh, you are asking a data scientist to construct the entire pipeline, right? So, but we look at this and I look at uh, solutions in other space, and which one uh, the most interesting one is the the build tools. Imagine that maybe many many years ago, how people compile a software project. They may have some best scripts, right? So which has GCC in it, and then just you run the best scripts, it will compile it and uh, from beginning and then give you the binary out. And then it came uh, make, right? So because best scripts is really kind of uh, hard and everyone has their own best scripts. When you do exchange, they need to look at the best script to understand what's inside and what's the logic. But then make standardize is uh, you have the target and you have to see how you produce that target, right? So, and you can use make and then you can use make install to install uh, the software. And is that good enough? It's a make is something like TFX and Metaflow, right? So you have those, the, you can define this, the, uh, the dependencies and then it will help you to execute efficiently. And I look at there's a stack overflow question about, so why just no Java developers use make? And the answer is, yeah, because there is Apache Maven, right? So what Maven does is Maven standardize on a couple of things. It's one is the palm file, 
right? So the metadata about your projects and it's portable, exchangeable, everyone understands this and you can have dependencies declared inside this pump file. And then it has this standard build lifecycle. You have compile, you have test, you have package, you have publish. Right, so if everyone follows it, they don't really need to go to the lower level make. Right, so and then it has this the standard directory layout. Right, so source mean, uh, source test, where you put your uh, documentation, and it's all standardized. If you follow this opinionated way, and uh, you can get your project built easily with Maven. And then I'm thinking about how this maps to machine learning. Right, so is there any tool that's uh, that's called the machine learning build tool? Mm. And I don't see any. I don't see any. Yeah. So then I look at the reason is maybe because machine learning problems are unique, are all unique, and you cannot really have a single build lifecycle to define to capture all the machine learning projects. But then I think is are they all unique? Is it just uh, say there's an 80 20 rule applied here? Right, so maybe the eighty percent of the problems are just uh, simple problems. They are classification, regression, forecasting. Are they fall naturally from clusters? Right, so if there are clusters, can we apply a standard solution to solve them? And uh, then we can keep the the data scientist and in their comfort zone. Right, so think about feature engineering, think about the modeling and the reasoning about the output, uh, the prediction, the accuracy of the model. And, but let me take care of the rest, right? So maybe we can define those uh, build life cycle for typical machine learning problem types, right? So in this uh, machine learning uh, MLflow pipeline, we now release the first predefined, we call predefined pipeline templates. And the first one is for regression. That means if you have a simple regression problem, you can just uh, say, take over this uh, template and we already have a lot of things pre-implemented for you. For example, how you do the split. Is it always a random split? Uh, is it always good? It's not, right? So if you have a new data coming in and uh, you always turn over the uh, data over the past one month, you don't always want to do a random split because uh, now you will get uh, the training data from the previous batch becoming the test data in the current batch, right? So you want to do a split based on the content of your records. And, uh, but do you want data scientists to implement this part that they don't, they don't really care, right? So we can just have this built in as a split step and the user don't need to write any code, right? So then they can focus on what feature transformations they want to do or oh, what estimators they want to use, or even if they don't care about the estimators they want to use, they can just uh, give it to AutoML, right? So like AutoML automatically train, they just provide, hey, well, this is my budget for different environments, right? So local development, I want a small budget. I want to quickly test this end to end. But when I get into staging production, I want to increase my budget and uh, to get a better trend model. And then we can offer, because we predefined the stack, we know what's happening at even individual steps. We can offer those, uh, say we call step cards, right? So we assume that the user uses a notebook to execute those steps. And if they do, for example, if they finish the split step, we are going to show this uh, distribution comparison between the train validation and test and make sure, well, you don't have huge outliers and uh, that will ruin your, know, just uh, say, uh, metric model evaluation in validation and test, right? So after you run train, and we're going to show your model metrics. And uh, then we're also going to show, for example, what's the worst examples in this transaction. And you can see them and you can see, oh, what's missing in your modeling, right? So after you do evaluate, we're going to show the feature importance automatically for you. And so basically there are many things that uh, are boilerplate code. Yeah. Right, so, and, but they are useful. And I don't want data scientists to rewrite them for all their projects. And we have them built in and we try to add more best practices and embed it. So that's opinionated. Yes. Right, so I, I, yeah, that's very opinionated. 
I am thrilled that you took us through that because mm -hmm. I think we have on periodically open source contributors, maintainers, creators of projects. But this is one of the few times where I really feel like I got a very deep understanding of how you thought about not just the solution to the problem, but how you even understood that this was a problem, right? Going back mm -hmm. to the TFX comparison, thinking about the make file versus Project Maven uh, in a different coding context entirely and what that means for machine learning engineering. So thank you so much for sharing that. What I want to do with our remaining time here very quickly is kind of get a sense of, you know, I want to go back to where you started this conversation. You mentioned that the Databricks founders that you interviewed with had a really clear vision of the future. And you're sitting here as a uh, engineer that's been helping the machine learning ecosystem build for the last eight years. I want to understand, like, what's your vision for the future, right? Like 10 years from now with where we're at, you know, with the adoption of cloud computing, the shift mm -hmm. to real time, all these things, where are we as data scientists and machine learning in 10 years? Where's MLOps? Yep. So I would say MLOps will fade away to data scientists. It's, uh, it's like, like I mentioned, it's like how you compute uh, me and the variance on MapReduce. Right, so they used to learn, and then with the new kind of a product coming out, they don't have to learn. So, with I think it's uh, we we discuss a lot about whether data scientists can own end to end, that's from development to production, and but to me, my preference is yeah that future will never come. It's it will be the software engineers or machine learning engineers owning production, right? So, but how how much we can do is to enable more data to just enable data scientists to do more, right? So rather than just uh, owning the entire production is can we just uh, let them to own the model iterations, right? So, and can they just simply push a code change and get everything just as uh, a report back to them? And uh, can we get automatically model deployment and uh, through this offline and online evaluation, right? So I think that's the future. Is uh, data scientists don't need to worry about what's inside the production because the production system, the MLOps uh, system, will already provide uh, all the guardrails and to help them to ship a model into production. Um, however, I think it's uh, in order to get that future in. It's uh, I really think it's Databricks. That's why while well, I'm thinking about it's the right platform to build that future because. As I mentioned, it's MLOps is really the DevOps, Model Ops, and Data Ops. You need a platform that can handle all of them. And uh, for example, if you have a model deployed to production, right? So, and the production system, if you don't want to bother page data scientists whenever there is some issue happening, right? So you want the production system need to know how this model performs. And uh, how do you know that? It's uh, you need uh, the labels. At least you need the labels, right? So the labels may arrive uh, late than the, the the request, right? So that means you need uh, some data engine to join the labels and with the with the original feature and the predictions, and to monitor your model quality, and then you also need to know what's the downstream business impact, right? So like you have a CTR model, but you actually care about the 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 final conversion rate. Right, so that means yeah. your system also need to know the conversion rate. That means your ML system need to know the conversion rate in yeah. order to keep your model up to date. Yeah, that would require model machine learning and data together. Yep, to get get things rolling. So yeah, I think yeah, that's how I think about the future. It's basically product become very simpler. ML ops becomes uh, much much simpler, and data scientists can. They don't need to learn extra tools, right? So they just uh, say, stay with within their expertise and uh, focusing on the modeling and how to uh, how to use machine learning to power the business. So I think that's the future we are we are building. The fun part. Could... The data scientists get to do the fun part. Yes. And what they mm -hmm. enjoy doing, and <laughs> then. Everybody just, in an ideal world, everybody just gets to do what they enjoy doing. 
and then yep. leave the other parts for the other people. So, dude, Harmony. before we finish, yeah, exactly. I want to know what is a piece of technology that you're bullish on that would surprise people? That would surprise people. Um, I think what what how do we define surprise? It's a uh, usually my observation is uh, if I have a technology right, so that enable people to lift up what people can do, right? So for example, if you can enable citizen data centers to do production engine uh, machine learning, so that would be a big surprise because it just uh, say make the product uh, reachable to many, right? So uh, if you can make data analysts to do data engineering, right? So, and that's a big surprise. So, but I, we hope, well, with the, just uh, say the, our product or the future version of product, we do, we can enable citizen data scientists. A lot of people who are new to machine learning and uh, who don't even know machine learning can, can get models into production. So that's, yeah. that's, that would be a big surprise to everyone. And, but that's also a challenge. It's, uh, we, we had a product similar, just uh, along this direction It's uh, last year, I mainly work on this AutoML product called Databricks OTML. And the, the key feature we have is rather than just uh, return a, a opaque model and the, from this uh, hyperparameter tuning back to the users, we actually return the code to reproduce that model training. Right, so because we believe, well, mm, it's not always the OTML can do the best for you. Right, so sometimes you have to embed your own kind of domain knowledge of the, the business problem and to further improve this model and get it into production. So yeah, then the, in this way, well, we do have customers and who are data engineers and uh, who use AutoML and then, well, with a few modification in the generated code, and then they can already get really good quality um, production models. So that's a long way, but I don't think we are there yet. There's just still many, many things to do. Nice. So I meant surprise people as in if someone were to ask you about a piece of technology that you're bullish on, and then you said, oh, I'm really interested in home automation. They would go, what? That is crazy. That's a surprise. I would have never guessed that you are interested in home automation. I think data, you betting on uh, what you're doing at Databricks is probably an easy one that might not surprise people. <laughs> So the, do you have any others that are surprising? Like you're like, oh, well, this new, very, very small project that is open sourced out of Australia is very exciting to me or something like that. Mm. Yeah, currently just that uh, nothing come out of my mind. Okay. <laughs> so no, that's fine. when you read books, what do you read? What's the last book you've read? Oh, the last one is really this is called a uh, good strategy by strategy book. It's recommended by our CEO. It's, uh, uh it's about how we think about, uh, how we define the strategy and thinking about, uh, our strengths and weaknesses, right? So how you, uh, get a good, uh, diagnosis of the market and then see how you position your product. So that, that was the, the last book I read. That's awesome. That sounds like a really cool book. I want to get into that. All right, man, we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you for coming on. It has been so incredible to get to chat with you. I mean, this has been a long time coming. I know that we've wanted to do this for a while. I've been a fan of your work and everything that you've been doing at Databricks. So it's almost a little bit like uh, a dream to be able to have you here. And um, I'm very thankful that you've given us the time. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. <laughs>